You shouldn't be proud of being unhealthy. You shouldn't be proud of telling people to kill themselves. What the fuck? <laughs> Can I smell it? I can't eat it, but how good, how good it is this feel? <laughs> to smell it. <laughs> Don't get it. Bro, the car looks even sideways because you are so heavy. Fat shaming is always okay. It's just gonna help you stay alive for 15 more years. Ma, may I have cookie? No, diabito. Roll back to kitchen. Oh. I think the guy had a crush on me at Burger King. Because he gave me three sauces, and usually they forget my sauce. I think that's like a little way of him saying, yeah, you're cute. <laughs> Maybe if you order three portions, you get three sauces? Throughout this video, we'll dive into a topic that affects many of us, fast food addiction. We're here to explore the science behind why fast food can become addictive. Hi everyone, just a reminder that just because I'm fat and I exist on the internet doesn't mean that you can give me unwanted health advice that I have for the last four years have said no to, okay? Fat people's existence is not consent for unwanted health advice. But why? You obviously need it. Why the anger? Comment not available of course. Comment not available of I block them. When I do that I think their comments go away anymore but not sure since I haven't sued TikTok in a while. I was doing donuts in the back of the parking lot in that wheelchair. <laughs> that wheelchair gave her so much freedom that she was not used to. I figured it out. It's like riding a bull, y'all lean with it. Had to deliver a pizza to someone like that and I couldn't help but feel like I assisted in a suicide. Yep, hold on, hold on, hold on. Fuck. It's this shoe. I mean, a proper shoe would make a difference. Have you ever wondered why it's so challenging to resist the temptation of fast food? Well, it turns out there's science behind it. Fast food is carefully engineered to be not only delicious but also addictive. High levels of salt, sugar, and unhealthy fats can trigger pleasure centers in our brains, releasing neurotransmitters like dopamine making us crave more as you might assume i get a lot of comments like this and honestly like they make me really sad because as a fat person like existing in the world there's literally nothing i can do about this because this is about you and like your illness and I don't know the fact that like my body existing in my body freely loving my body could trigger someone to harm themselves how is not eating dinner harming yourself is difficult to navigate and all I can say is that, like, I hope that you have the help that you deserve. I hope that you have people in your life who are looking out for you. And I hope that you know deep down inside, even if you don't, whatever. Like, maybe this comment was just to be mean and that's okay, but... I mean, it's not okay, but, like, it is what it is, you know? People are going to be mean online, but, but I hope that you know that you deserve to be fed. You deserve to be nourished. And it doesn't matter what you look like, you still deserve to eat. <laughs> Even if you were 600 pounds, right? 800 pounds. You still deserve to eat. You deserve to be nourished. You deserve to have your needs met. But that is not nourishment. It's the opposite for me. I see your videos and feel so comfortable eating whatever my body wants to nourish it and my soul. It's good that these comments make you sad. Take it as motivation. 
every day I look at Tammy, I'm like, if I don't change now, I could possibly be her size. <laughs> she didn't eat anything. That was me. The, why the <laughs> shit hasn't shown anything? Because okay? she deals fluid of. She can't help it. That's the one thing she's been stressing about is the fluid. None of your tests show that you're retaining water, okay? You're not 700 pounds of water. Ever since I had surgery on my leg, you can't tell me that I haven't because I have. I've been through this since I was 15 years. Protect her man at all cost. He a real one. Real one to collect the life insurance policy on her. When we eat fast food, our brain's reward pathways light up, creating a pleasurable sensation. Dopamine, often called the feel-good neurotransmitter, plays a significant role here. Over time, our brains can become desensitized to dopamine, leading us to seek more fast food to experience the same pleasure, just like how addiction works. I'm losing nothing. I'm don't add up. You don't think your weight has to do anything with your eating habit? No, I don't. You don't need to respond so aggressively against them or any comment that goes against your views. Please be mature about how you respond. Very interesting comment. Uh, one, clearly you've never seen any of my other content. Um, my response in that video is me not being, like, outwardly angry. It's frustration for sure. That's not me being angry. At all. And also, uh, tone policing. <laughs> We're not doing that here. If I want to get angry, I'm allowed to get angry at someone who's harassing me and discriminating against me because of my size. You're not allowed to tell me I'm not allowed to get angry about that, and you're not allowed to police how I respond to that. So yeah, if you think uh, me standing up for myself and educating other people and speaking my own voice is immature, then so be it. I'm immature to you. Great. Have a wonderful day and don't comment again. Don't post again. Tone policing? Many fast foods are loaded with highly processed ingredients, preservatives, and artificial additives. These not only lack essential nutrients but can also disrupt our body's natural hunger and fullness cues. As a result, we may find ourselves constantly craving more, leading to overeating and, eventually, addiction-like behavior. I forgot, it comes with like a huge salad. Wow, I didn't realize the salad was gonna be that big. And then it all comes with some breadsticks. So I'm supposed to get garlic bread. It came with like a bunch of these. I was gonna eat this regardless. So I was just like, you know what? Let's do a taste test. It's like a vodka sauce with fettuccine. I don't know. I know it's hard to believe, but I've been eating a lot of salad lately. Yum. I'm probably only gonna have like one or two of these. So I give this like three and a half. I hate wasting food, but I'm wasting this. You know what? Sauce is really good. Mental health is important. I'm only going to have two of these. Yeah, okay. She has gained a lot of weight. She always pretends the order is wrong or she didn't know it came with this or that. I just I don't understand why she does this continuously. Diet Coke will cancel out all the non-diet stuff. Do you want to help protect plus-size creators on TikTok? If you do, please watch the rest of this. I've had a lot of discussion on my page recently about how the comments have really gotten out of control lately on TikTok. And the community guidelines and moderators on TikTok are doing absolutely nothing about it. If anything, plus size creators are getting penalized because their videos responding to comments will get taken down. However, the bullies are protected. So I decided to start a petition again. Here's the petition. So I decided to start a petition, again. Again. Kinda depressing, but not giving up. But then the moderators should also ban spreading misinformation like being fat is healthy. Exactly though. Just because I am booked to model does not mean that anyone is promoting the size that my body is. Thank you for running into the point. But she says support, not promote. She wants to say approve, I suppose. You're literally just existing and serving looks. Fat phobia is such brain rot. Fat acceptance is brain rot. Jordan, 
Do you think you benefit from pretty privilege? I mean, would you model if you weren't simply pretty? I don't know why, but I'm curious what you think. What do you order at Burger King? Uh, probably the Whopper. One Whopper? Yeah. That's it? No fries? No drink? Mm -mm. It usually takes me like two days to eat that thing, so... A Whopper? Yeah. Yeah, me too. I can't eat a Whopper in one meal. That's way too <laughs> much food. I'm lucky if I eat a quarter of it, then I put the rest in the fridge and save for the next day or whatever, so... He just had surgery. You can easily tell. Throughout this video, let's explore how fast food can wreak havoc on your gut microbiome and lead to a range of complications. To understand the connection between fast food and your gut health, we first need to grasp the concept of the gut microbiome. Your gut is home to trillions of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, collectively known as the gut microbiome. These microorganisms play a crucial role in digesting food, absorbing nutrients, and regulating your immune system. But here's the kicker. They also have a profound impact on your mental health. Let me tell you a story. When I was 13 years old, I had had a cough all summer. So I went to the doctor's office. The doctor took one look at me and said, you know what? Maybe you should lose weight. Turns out I had walking pneumonia. I had fluid on my lungs. And if I had not advocated for myself in that moment, I don't know what would have happened. Size discrimination impacts 34 million people in the United States. 84% of adults in the U.S. live in larger bodies. As a disability advocate, I cannot ignore how often fat discrimination leads to further disablement. Lose some weight is generally good advice. While the personal story shared in the video is undoubtedly impactful, it's crucial to recognize that individual experiences can't represent the entirety of a complex issue. She seems to imply a direct causation between size discrimination and further disablement. It's important to avoid oversimplifying the link between these issues and to consider other contributing factors. Had a doctor once tell me if I was thinner I wouldn't have caught the flu, was over 250 at the time. Just one instance of 100s experienced. Wanna be skinny but I wanna eat shit, and that's why my life is problematic. Do you think if I overeat myself to near death I can be called a beautiful model too? I don't know for sure, but I definitely think you should try. The question might be on point, but not the answer. I get this as a joke to a backhanded comment, but there are kids that may think this true everybody is beautiful no matter shape, size, or skin. Our mom told us when we were younger, if we ate a sugar, you drink a Diet Coke afterwards and it'll cancel out the sugar. Okay. Enter the gut-brain axis, the intricate communication network between your gut and brain. It's like a two-way street where signals travel back and forth, influencing everything from mood and stress to cognitive function. A balanced gut microbiome is essential for maintaining a healthy gut-brain axis. But what happens when you indulge in that fast food craving? Fast food is often loaded with saturated fats, sugar, and highly processed ingredients. When you consume it regularly, it disrupts the delicate balance of your gut microbiome. Let's talk about all the weird things that happen when you're a bigger girl. When you meet a new group of guys for the first time and they introduce themselves to every other girl in the group and skip over you. Or if they do acknowledge you, they'll give you that shitty limp handshake while looking in the other direction. Don't want to make eye contact with the fatty. When store employees ask every other person in there if they need help finding something, but not you. When you're out with a bunch of people and you're hungry, but no one else is hungry, so then you don't want to eat because then of course the fat girl is eating. Having irrational fears about showing up to parties for the first time, are they going to let me in or am I too big? When someone asks to borrow some clothes and then they're just so ridiculously shocked about how massive it is on them. Last but not least, and my personal favorite, when a guy tries to keep his relationship and his attraction to you a secret. People actually do that? Wow. When you exercise people, congrats you. Fast food promotes the growth of harmful bacteria while reducing the beneficial ones. This imbalance can lead to inflammation and a compromised gut lining, often referred to as leaky gut syndrome. Now, let's connect the dots. A compromised gut microbiome doesn't just affect your digestive system, it can have a cascading effect on your mental health. 
Research suggests that an unhealthy gut may contribute to mood disorders like depression and anxiety. It can also impair cognitive function and increase the risk of neurodegenerative diseases. But that's not all. The consequences of fast food on your gut health extend beyond mental well-being. It can also lead to a host of other complications, including obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. What do you mean you don't know? And yeah. you think that you're not eating and you're getting... I don't want to get malnourished either. Do you look like you're malnourished? It is thin privilege, and even if she does binge and purge, she still has thin privilege regardless of her eating disorder. Especially when people who have eating disorders, who are thin, are treated 10 years faster than fat people. When fat people have eating disorders, we are not believed. It can take as long as 13 years to get diagnosed because of fat phobia. Whereas when a thin person has an eating disorder of some kind, it can take them under three years to get diagnosed, which is faster because of thin privilege. Thin people get diagnosed more. But regardless of her having an eating disorder or not, she still has thin privilege. Mind you, I don't care if she has an eating disorder. That's not my business because her body is not my business. That's why I never commented on her body in the video. I talked about myself and just duetted her for a physical example of the comment section. But can't you say someone has ED just by their looks? Overeating is not an ED. Two things can be true at the same time. The impact on your gut microbiome can even affect your immune system, making you more susceptible to infections. Now, let's talk about obesity. Obesity rates have been steadily rising, and the consequences are far-reaching. Obesity increases the risk of chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. It can strain your joints, lead to sleep apnea, and even contribute to certain types of cancer. Obesity can take a toll on a person's mental and emotional well-being. my whole life running from this word because every day I was made to feel as though it was something worth running from. And to this day, there are still people that would like for me to continue this misguided marathon while they shout fat as if it's the worst thing I could ever be. Now you would think that because body size discrimination harms more than two thirds of the U.S. population every day, there would be legislative protection against it. Marathon? Running? The outfit is so slay. You have more important things to worry about. Obesity also brings practical challenges in daily life. Simple activities like climbing stairs or fitting into standard-sized seats can become major hurdles. This can limit mobility and independence. Weight management often requires a multifaceted approach, including balanced nutrition and regular exercise. Although she is a joke, let's try a critical view. Doctors should never be prescribing weight loss to anyone, ever, at any point in time. And here's why. When we recommend any procedure, treatment, medication or whatever, we need to be thinking about the pros and the cons, the benefits and the risks. So what are the benefits of intentional weight loss? Well, the main one is you become thinner temporarily mind you because up to 98 percent of people will regain all of the weight that they lost within five years up to two-thirds of them actually will gain back more than they lost in the first place there are some possible temporary health benefits but none of them are long lasting for example you may be able to get your diabetes into remission for like you know 12 months 18 months but no longer than that for the vast majority of people but there are instances where it might be medically necessary such as in the case of severe obesity impacting an individual's overall health. She generalizes that 98% of people will regain all the weight, ignoring individual cases where sustainable weight loss has been achieved and maintained. Also temporary improvements, such as diabetes remission, can be crucial for an individual's immediate health and might provide a window for implementing further lifestyle changes. This does not touch upon the psychological aspects of weight loss, such as improved self-esteem, mental well-being, and reduced risk of depression, which can be important for overall health and quality of life. She seems to undermine the autonomy of individuals to make decisions about their own health with their healthcare providers. While not directly mentioned in the segment, health-related quality of life improvements, such as reduced joint pain, better sleep, and increased mobility, are often associated with weight loss. 
These improvements can significantly enhance one's overall well-being. She doesn't consider the risks associated with obesity, such as increased likelihood of heart disease, stroke, and certain types of cancer. In fact, most of the data out there focuses A, on the short-term benefits, and B, more on health risks rather than health outcomes. And by that, I mean they'll focus on your blood pressure or your A1C or your cholesterol rather than focusing on, say, heart attacks or strokes or um, cancer. But what about the risks? Well, there are lots of them. First of all, there are the physical risks. People who diet suffer from malabsorption, um, poor energy levels, and when taken to extreme levels, they can become dehydrated. They can even cause damage to their heart, their kidneys, and various other internal organs. Then there's the psychological damage, the low mood, low self-worth, um, increased rates of anxiety, depression, and even suicidality. Poor cognition, inability to concentrate, she doesn't acknowledge the extensive research linking obesity to long-term health outcomes like heart attacks, strokes, and certain cancers. While extreme dieting can indeed have physical consequences, she simplifies the risks. The risks mentioned, such as malabsorption and damage to internal organs, often occur in extreme cases and are not representative of moderate, supervised weight loss efforts. While psychological effects like low mood and increased anxiety are mentioned, she doesn't provide context. These issues can arise due to various factors, not just weight loss attempts. Mental health is multifaceted and cannot be solely attributed to weight loss efforts. She generalizes the psychological effects of dieting without considering individual differences. Some individuals may experience improved mental health and well-being after weight loss, especially if it aligns with their personal goals and leads to a healthier lifestyle. She oversimplifies the risks associated with weight loss efforts and neglects the potential long-term health benefits. Poorer memory, uh, inability to do basic, simple tasks that were once quite easy for you. And that's just in the short term. What about the risk of eating disorders? The more you diet and the more extreme your dieting techniques, the higher the risk of you developing an eating disorder, which is particularly bad if you're a person with a bigger body, because that's also far less likely to get diagnosed and far less likely to get treated properly. Then there's weight cycling or weight fluctuations, which have been shown over and over again to be detrimental to people in the long term. Then there's weight stigma, which has been shown to be particularly detrimental to our health. So to sum up, a very few benefits, most of them temporary, and multiple risks, most of them long term. You don't need to be a genius to figure out why. I am strongly against doctors recommending weight loss. While it's true that extreme dieting can be a risk factor for eating disorders, it's essential to highlight that not everyone who diets develops an eating disorder. Generalizing this risk might create unnecessary fear around weight loss efforts. She overlooks the benefits of adopting a healthier lifestyle, which can include improved energy levels, better sleep, enhanced mood, and reduced risk of chronic diseases. Weight loss, when achieved through balanced nutrition and exercise, can positively impact overall health. While she mentions the challenges faced by people with eating disorders, there are treatment options available. It's important to advocate for proper diagnosis, awareness, and improved mental health support rather than discouraging individuals from pursuing health goals. Introducing Project Primrose, a digital dress that brings fabric to life. We will literally do anything that actually prioritize plus size fashion, diverse fashion. Instead of fixing the problems we already have, someone said, let's make a digital dress, an ugly digital dress and call it revolutionary. Okay, cool. I'm glad that you can put a jumbotron on the front of you and push a button and it changes from an ugly dress to an even uglier dress. And I'm not trying to be unkind. Like congrats to everybody that worked so hard. Yay. <laughs> but like we have bigger issues no pun intended like stop with the performative bs already this is why it's so important to have actual diversity in fashion everyone just thinks it's so you know big bitches like me can have clothes okay like that's part of the reason but like shit like this is not the answer i'm sorry don't want to sound mean but i think that obese people have other things to worry about instead of fashion set priorities health than beauty
Just don't think that fashion should be on obese people's minds. I don't understand shitting on someone's creativity. Just because it's not for you, doesn't make it bad. And yes I am plus sized. Creating extreme plus size clothing involves intricate designs and different production processes. No, on your back. She flew out the scene. I think as a society we have progressed beyond the need to use fat as an insult. It's a fucking adjective. I don't know what people expect the reaction to be when you call someone fat. Like they say it like they're driving a spear through your fucking heart. You're fat. Yes, congratulations on having eyeballs, bitch. I was in this body before you saw it. What do you think I'm looking at, idiot? No other adjective is treated that way. If I came up to you and said you're tall, you wouldn't want to sock me in the face. Incorrect. If you went up to a short person and say, you're short, you're gonna have to defend yourself. It is somehow true that you can associate being fat with laziness, lack of self-discipline, or poor health. I left Target a little while ago, and I had to pull over because I'm a little upset. So, this little girl pointed out my dress to her mother and said that she loved it because it was up. It's up themed. And her mother said, it's cute for a little girl, but it's childish for a grown woman. Okay, fine. I just get my shoes and I head to the front because I just want to get out of there, right? Because I can't go in anywhere without people being terrible. So as I'm leaving the store, I, this chick is walking by me and she's like, oh, the fatties are out today. You know, you can tell it's Easter because they're snagging up all the candy. I got shoes. I got shoes. I didn't even get candy. I didn't even go in there for Easter candy. Like, what is wrong with people? What do I don't leave my house? People suck. Why do you want to be a victim? Do you look for excuses for your lifestyle? No matter what you do, you will never be able to please everyone. Be you. Be free. Ignore dumb people. Hugs and love and you're beautiful. While empathy and understanding are crucial, it's equally important not to lose sight of personal resilience and self-responsibility. There's a concerning trend of neglecting self-care. Mental and physical health should be our utmost priority. Neglecting our well-being, both mentally and physically, while getting easily offended, is a paradox that needs addressing. We must empower ourselves to handle life's challenges robustly. First thing people notice about you Watch, it's gonna be my eyes. I get that a lot. <gasps> that's... That's fatphobic! This filter is sick. How dare it? Fupin's a smash. TikTok really said, let me humble you. Throughout this video, we're delving into a topic that might surprise you. The potential drawbacks of frequent eating. Now, before we begin, it's essential to understand that every individual's body is different and what works for one person might not work for another. Let's explore the health facts you need to know about frequent eating. Am I depressed? Uh, could a depressed person stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning, making a ton of onigiri? I didn't think so. What? What does manic mean? <laughs> While this is a joke, depression can lead to emotional eating, where individuals use food as a way to cope with negative emotions. Plot twist. Many of us have been conditioned to believe that frequent eating, often in the form of snacking, is healthy. However, our digestive system needs time to process the food we eat fully. Constantly supplying it with more food can overwhelm the system, leading to issues like indigestion, bloating, and discomfort. We all know that it's totally fine to make fun of fat people because being obese is a choice. We all just wake up one day and, he's, and decide, you know what, I, I hate myself, I don't want to live anymore, let's speed up the death process. You know, that's a choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> fat people are held to really high standards. Once they start losing weight, they tend to become assholes who hold everyone else to those same high standards. Fat people will be like, I hate myself, but I made a choice and did all the hard work because instead of you know, going to rehab or getting treatment, I decided to cut out half of my stomach. 
and then they'll be like, you have a small pee-pee? That's a choice. Every time I visit the hub, I see dozens of advertisements for different products to take your small pee-pee into a big pee-pee. And if you haven't tried each one of those methods at least once, then you're not trying hard enough to have a big pee-pee. What is this analogy? When we eat frequently, especially foods high in sugars and carbohydrates, our blood sugar levels can spike. While this might give us a temporary burst of energy, it's often followed by a crash. These fluctuations can leave us feeling tired, irritable, and can even contribute to cravings for more sugary snacks. If you're a short king, and you spend more time complaining about being a short king, instead of researching methods like surgeries and supplements into going, then you're choosing to be a short king and you deserve to stay a short king. Skinny people. All you skinny people choose to be skinny too because if you didn't want to be skinny, you would make a choice. Find your TDE and force yourself to eat 500 calories above your TDE every day so you can gain a pound a week. The choice. I don't care if you're poor. Have you chose to get a job? Jesus. Dude. But how is it not a choice to put food in your mouth or not? Who is feeding you? Who chooses what you eat? Contrary to popular belief, eating small meals throughout the day doesn't necessarily boost your metabolism. In fact, constant eating might lead to overeating, as we tend to underestimate the total calories we consume. This can contribute to weight gain over time, especially if the foods are high in calories and low in nutrients. No, I will not be taking the latest weight loss fad, diet, or pill, but thanks for asking. Nor should you, beside the fact that you can benefit, but you can be more mindful of what you eat. It's all about mindful eating and balanced nutrition. Opt for nutrient-dense meals that keep you satisfied for longer periods. Regular meal times allow your body to digest properly and help maintain stable blood sugar levels. You just don't seem happy at all being at that weight. Like 98% of your page is you complaining and being miserable. Well, I'm genuinely curious, apart from the fact that I disagree with you, I'm genuinely curious where have I complained about being fat on my page or in my entire life? Where have I complained about hating my body? Where have I complained about not liking myself because I'm fat and whatnot? Where have I complained about my body? or being fat, or maybe even like personal like issues related. But where have I complained about those? Cause I'm, I don't think I have. You can try and quote me saying, I hate my body, I hate myself, I hate being fat. Like you can try and find those, but I don't think I've ever said anything like that. What I have complained about is the way people treat me because of my body, but that's not me complaining about being fat. That's not me saying I'm miserable because I'm fat. Actually, I've never stated or quoted that I've ever been miserable because I'm fat. So I'm genuinely curious why you think that, or if it's just fat phobia and you're just blinded by that. But studies suggest there might be a correlation between body weight and mental health. Obesity is associated with a higher risk of having certain mental health disorders, including anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder. People are very cruel to you for being who you are and yet you seem unhappy. You did? Oh, wow. Yay. Oh, my gosh. Yay. Don't be jealous, please. Understanding the impact of frequent eating on our health is the first step towards making positive changes. Let's focus on nourishing our bodies with whole, balanced meals and allowing our digestive systems the time they need to function optimally. For the millionth fucking time, existing as a fat person is not promoting obesity. Loving your body and being confident about your body is also not promoting obesity. So fuck off, bitch. No one is suggesting that merely existing as a person with a certain body type promotes anything. It's essential to distinguish between promoting an unhealthy lifestyle and promoting self-acceptance, which brings us to the next point. The assertion here is that self-love and body confidence have no relation to promoting unhealthy behaviors. But is it really that simple? The problem lies in the oversimplification of a complex issue. It's crucial to recognize that discussions around body positivity and acceptance are often more nuanced than a simple love your body slogan. 
I'm just sitting here <laughs> waiting for my appointment with my dietitian, <laughs> which starts in like three minutes, and Jess goes, wait, don't you have your fat thing? My fat thing? What is my fat thing? What is that? Your dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, okay. <laughs> You have a dietitian? Find a new one. All my things are fat things. Body shaming has never left this app, but I have noticed a uptick recently in more like high profile instances of it. And there are like two types of people who make pathetic, unwarranted comments about fat people simply existing. It's either completely anonymous or their entire personality and feed is gym stuff. And I stumbled across a user who's the perfect example of this. You can't really make a gym rat feel bad about themselves. What are you going to tell them? That their body sucks and they look awful? They'll probably agree and hit another set. Now don't get too excited because they have not become self-aware. You can't get in our heads. We're already in them and choosing self-improvement. While you dive into a pool of Cheeto. Toxic fitness culture wrapped up in a pretty little bow just for you and me. It is this unearned sense of social entitlement because despite constantly working on themselves, they are so full of self-hatred and self-loathing that when they witness someone who has a body type that is their worst fear loving themselves, they have literal tantrums. Losers! Blanket statements like these can oversimplify the complex issue of body image and perpetuate stereotypes about those who are passionate about fitness. Using derogatory terms like loser is counterproductive and perpetuates the same negativity. Do they think that unhealthy relationships with the gym are somehow better than unhealthy relationships with food? How the hell can you have a bad relationship with taking care of yourself? Please don't assume a fat person has an unhealthy relationship with food. I don't even like Cheetos but I'm about to grab a whole ass bag and eat it just for that creator. Complaining about having to buy two plane tickets is totally your own fault. What have the airline CEOs got on you, is my question. What have they done that have you so enthralled that you view their systematically shrinking of airline seats so that they can make more and more and more profits is the fault of fat people? How do we get there? The fact may be that seats are much smaller today than in previous decades but we are talking about decades. And if you force people to choose side, of course we will pick the more sane one. It's always the former fats who are the most fat phobic. You're not superior because you became smaller. If the airlines can't make seats big enough for all their flyers, they should be put out of business. This is my announcement that I'm fat and I'm perfectly okay with that. And if you're not, find a new fucking hobby. Why the need to announce? People who are insecure about themselves get so pressed when fat girls love their own beautiful bodies. It must be tiring to be so hateful to be honest. You're not fat. You have fat. You also have fingernails, but you're not fingernails. Let's talk about how to stay so fresh and so clean clean as a plus size babe. Yup, that's right. I'm talking about plus size hygiene. When it comes to being a plus size babe, I have a dream team of personal care items and I'm gonna share them with you today. The number one item on my list is tea tree soap. The remedy for skin irritation for plus size babes, whether it comes to preventing or healing irritation. But wait, there's more. The next hygiene item I swear by as a plus size babe is body wipes. Your little pocket size refreshers ensuring you stay fresh and clean on the go. Your battle against chafing, consider it conquered. With Mega Babe Chafing Products, they're linked up on my profile. Keep discomfort at bay and your confidence soaring. And now, a standing ovation for the Lumi All Body Deodorant. Your backstage pass to an odor-free extravaganza. But, let's not forget the unsung hero, the back scrubber. Stepping in to get into them nooks and crannies. With this powerhouse lineup, you've got plus size hygiene tackled. Celebrate your uniqueness and let your confidence shine. Because you're worth every ounce of self-care luxury. I've never heard of body wipes. Hygiene maintenance wouldn't be an issue if something was done about the main problem. Why is it so hard to believe that fat people go to the gym and work out? Like, I'm very healthy, very athletic. 
I work out almost every day. Um, I am dunking on you bros and shitting on you hoes. I'm just saying, like, do you really want to go toe-to-toe with me in the gym? Because I'll eat it up. Just saying. She's literally obese. You can't actually believe someone who is clinically obese can be healthy. You definitely healthy. Definitely hasn't missed a meal. Every time she stands up, she is lifting heavy. Here's the problem with 1200 calorie diets from an anti-diet dietitian. Number one, 1200 calories is the requirement of a two-year-old. So if you are a grown woman, you should be eating way more than that. Number two, when you are under eating, the body's metabolism will slow down. So when you start to eat at a normal amount again, you will most likely gain weight, which is why diets don't work. And number three, when you are underfed, the body's really smart. It will send out neurotransmitters to make you think about food more, and it'll increase the hunger hormone called ghrelin. This increases the likelihood of overeating exponentially. Just what does my 600-pound life resident physician, Dr. Now, tell patients to eat? The diet involves eating up to three meals a day at about 400 to 600 calories each, with zero snacks, no sugar, and a boost in protein and fiber intake overall. Dr. TikTok's coming out to play. Dr. TikTok can diagnose you from a random video. It's pretty impressive. I'm really impressed. Oh my God, Dr. TikTok, you're so good at your job. How old are you? I love the songs you make up. If you've ever been uncomfortable in a restaurant because of your size, I know the struggle, and that's why I'm making today's video. Today's video is all about how restaurants can be more size inclusive and accessible for people of all sizes and abilities. With this video, I hope to educate some restaurant owners so that they can make their restaurants more size inclusive and accessible. Here are my 10 solutions for how restaurants can create a more inclusive environment. Solution number one, comfortable seating. Restaurants should provide spacious and sturdy chairs without armrests so that people of all sizes can dine comfortably. Solution number two, flexible table arrangements. Offer adjustable table configurations with ample space in between so people in larger bodies can navigate everything comfortably. Solution number three, accessible restrooms. Ensure restrooms are spacious and can comfortably accommodate plus size individuals and those with disabilities. Or instead of adjusting to your needs, why don't you lose some weight and adjust yourself to being healthy? Solution number one should be lose the weight. This will allow people to choose seating that suits their needs. Solution number five, provide key information on your website. Provide key information like table configurations, seat dimensions, chair weight capacities, and more on your website where it's easily accessible. Solution number six, ensure that your tables are not secured to the ground. Make sure they can be moved to make room for individuals who might need more space. Solution number seven, offer more room in booth seating. Make sure that there's plenty of space to move around between the table and booth seat. This will ensure that people of various body sizes can sit there and be comfortable. Solution number eight, staff training. Train staff on what type of accommodations can help plus size individuals have a better experience. Solution number nine, outdoor dining. If you've got an outdoor dining area, make sure you have some chairs without armrests and opt for chairs that do not have metal grating. This is a small change that can create a more open and inclusive atmosphere. Honest question, where is the line for the individual to demand everything to change for them, but no change can be demanded for the individual? And last but not least, solution 10, showcase photos. Consider showcasing photos of your typical seating and table setups on your website. It helps people plan ahead and sets the stage for a comfortable and welcoming dining experience. And these are just some of the ways that restaurants can become more size friendly and inclusive. So instead of working on yourself, you like nah, let the restaurant do something about it. If you'd prefer fat people walk around naked, I think we can make that happen. Where did you get that out of their comment? Sunscreen is easily fat friendly. As long as I have that, let me know when we're all gonna start going about naked. I'll bring the industrial sized sunscreen. I wish. Us fats get hot way easier than anyone else. We should be allowed to be nude and free. Hello, this is just a reminder that your body is lovely and it is beautiful and it is worthy of love. It is worthy of feeling cool in all this hot weather we've just had, although it is now raining where I live, but don't cover yourself up. That's not body positivity. Girl, this swimsuit on you is doing things to me. Is it that you hate fat people or is it that you can't handle that a fat person is successful 
traveling the world, having an absolutely wonderful life, and maybe doesn't hate themselves. You did not mention happy. Respect. But why the need to brag or to prove this? Mostly they just hate themselves. I would rather shit in my hands and clap. Insane things are expected. Obesity is a global health epidemic, with its consequences reaching far beyond just physical well-being. Recent studies have shed light on the remarkable connections between excess weight and brain health. Let's explore this throughout this video. Hello. So this is like a friendly reminder that my existence is not consent for you giving me advice or health advice. My existence, me walking by, you seeing me, that's not consent, okay? At all. Just like when I went to Fan Expo two weekends ago and I had to meet some people. Anyway, that's another story. Um, they had a sign that says cosplay is not consent, which is totally right. That's why you have to ask the fucking person. Hey, I like your cosplay. Can we take a photo? Yeah, sure. No problem. See, that's consent. Fucking seeing a fat person existing. That's not consent for harassing us and bullying us and giving us unwanted health advice. Okay. So instead of trying to police other people and police other bodies, um, to feed your fucking ego, just stop it. Worry about yourself. Okay? Thanks. Obese individuals often experience a state of chronic low-grade inflammation throughout their bodies. This inflammation can extend to the brain and has been linked to cognitive decline. Research suggests that the inflammatory processes associated with obesity may contribute to a higher risk of developing neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's. MRI scans have revealed that obesity can lead to structural and functional alterations in the brain. Regions responsible for cognitive functions, such as memory, attention, and decision-making, can undergo changes in size and connectivity. These alterations may impair cognitive performance and increase the risk of conditions like dementia. Objective beauty does not exist. So I always get these comments that are like, how do you people find this attractive? Glazing, if someone comments something positive, it'll just be like, lie, 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 lie. And I think we need to have an honest conversation about what we mean when we talk about attractiveness or beauty or desire. Because none of these things are actually objective truths. They are subjective, they are opinion. And what gets labeled as beautiful or desirable or attractive depends very heavily on both cultural norms and individual preference. That's why beauty standards change. Our body's complex hormonal system is intimately tied to both our weight and brain health. Obesity disrupts the delicate balance of hormones, such as insulin and leptin, which are crucial for regulating appetite, metabolism, and brain function. The dysregulation of these hormones can impact cognitive processes and contribute to cognitive impairment. And it's why it's so foolish to me when people come into my comments acting shocked that people find me attractive. Because the reality is that people find fat people attractive. People find trans and gender nonconforming people attractive. Maybe you don't because you subscribe to whatever the cultural beauty standard is. But you are not everyone. You are the societal like group think. And then there's everyone who does not subscribe to that. If you haven't done the work to question what you think is beautiful and why, I actually don't believe that you even can know what you as an individual find beautiful. Because as it currently stands, you are just subscribing to the beauty standards set by white supremacy. You have been conditioned to think that way. Obesity often comes hand in hand with other health conditions like high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. These conditions can impair blood flow to the brain, leading to reduced oxygen and nutrient supply. The compromised vascular health can hinder cognitive functioning and accelerate cognitive decline. 
you have been conditioned to think that way. So they're not really your thoughts. And if you really wanna get into it, even I am privileged by those beauty standards, by the fact that I am white, I have relatively symmetrical features, I have like an hourglass body shape. These are all things that are favored under our cultural white supremacist beauty standards. And similar to individual opinions on beauty, cultural beauty standards can be different and they can change depending on lots of different factors geographically they change based on time period you don't have to find me attractive i don't give two fucks what you think but you are also not the determiner of what is beautiful you do not dictate objective beauty Obesity is not only a physical health concern, but also takes a toll on our mental well-being. The psychological impact of obesity, such as low self-esteem, depression, and anxiety, can have detrimental effects on brain health. These mental health factors may further exacerbate cognitive impairment. Like I don't know about you guys but as a history girly I have always found Venus statues and figures absolutely gorgeous, sounds like a skill issue. But can a disease be beautiful? The good news is that there is hope for our brains. Adopting a healthy lifestyle that includes regular physical activity, balanced nutrition, and weight management can positively influence both our body and brain health. Studies have shown that lifestyle interventions can improve cognitive function and slow down cognitive decline in obese individuals. Fat girlfriends are like most other girlfriends, just with a couple limitations, all right? One, I can't go shopping with you at the mall. Two, I cannot ride that roller coaster with you. And three, I'm not going to be able to fuck you in a two seater. And many more. Baby, don't limit yourself. You can do all of that. But we can eat. Breakfast? Let's go. Dinner? Where are we going? Late night. Middle of the night. Feral snack sesh? I'm down. Today, I hate how I look. I hate how my clothes fit on me, I hate how my clothes look, and that's okay. We don't have to love our bodies every day, or even at all, in order to enjoy life. So much of our culture revolves around bodies and appearances, but in reality, it doesn't matter what we look like or if we like how we look on a day-to-day. -day. Our bodies are just that. The connection between obesity and brain health is undoubtedly a weighty matter. As we strive for a healthier future, it's important to recognize the impact excess weight can have on our cognitive functions. By understanding these connections and making positive lifestyle changes, we can pave the way for enhanced brain health and overall well-being. Our bodies are just that. Our bodies. We just exist within them. They're just a vessel for us to experience life. They aren't our life. It is not our life's purpose to be beautiful enough, to be thin enough, to be flattering. So stop fixating on that pimple, on how your body squishes or protrudes. None of that matters. On our bad days, we have got to stop fighting with our bodies. Let's spend that energy focusing on what really matters. We don't have to hide. Even on our bad body image days, we're still us. So what really matters? Enjoying food? That's all there is? Heavy reminder I really needed. But why do you hate the way you look right now though? Don't you look like many other fat babes? Isn't that fat phobic of you? Oh so now it's okay not to enjoy our bodies? But when somebody is complaining about their body looking a certain way you call them fat phobic. The conversation right now on whether it's fat phobic to not want to be fat to me just really feels like an attempt to deflect people from having to really unpack their internalized fat phobia and that can be from both fat people and non-fat people so i'm not going to answer that question but i am going to recommend some readings i think it's really important that people understand the deeper systemic issues connected to fat phobia she chose not to answer the question of whether it's fat phobic to not want to be fat Encouraging viewers to read is a valuable step, but it shouldn't replace a genuine discussion. You're still on this app? Christ. Thanks for boosting her content.
Yes, we need to get away from aspects of diet culture, but it is unhealthy to be overweight. No way around it. Hmm. This is a perfect example of weight stigma and assuming someone's health from the size of their body. If this were true, that it was unhealthy to be overweight, which is a blanket statement, then everyone who was overweight would be unhealthy. And that is simply not the case. You cannot tell how healthy a person is just by looking at them. You cannot tell how healthy a person is by the size or the shape of their body or what category of the BMI they fit into. These assumptions harm people. Weight stigma, which is discrimination or stereotype based on someone's body size, has been shown to be correlated with worse health outcomes, physical, mental, and emotional. It is also highly linked to chronic dieting, unhealthy weight control practices, and eating disorders. This oversimplifies the argument by suggesting that being overweight is never associated with health risks. That's not entirely accurate. While not everyone who is overweight is unhealthy, it's important to acknowledge that excess weight can be a risk factor for various health conditions. And here's where the conversation needs to delve deeper. While weight stigma is detrimental, it's also essential to consider that obesity can indeed increase the risk of certain health problems. We need to be careful not to swing to the other extreme by suggesting that body weight has zero relevance to health. Now that I think about it, I've never seen a definitive definition of healthy. And similarly everyone that is not overweight is healthy with no illnesses at all. It's all simply not true but people just make assumptions. Using the word skinny to market products that have fewer calories or are healthier is fat phobic. Skinny pop, skinny cow, with the tape measure tied around the waist. And you can try to change the logo, but it's still fat phobic. Skinny girl. Egregious. Just egregious. To make something have fewer calories, less sugar, you say make it skinny? Smoothie King? I hope you can now see how people use fat phobia as a marketing tool. It's not about those options having less calories and less sugar, it's the way they're marketed. This is insane. Isn't this too much? If this is not a joke, it's out of control. I honestly never thought of it this way, but it really seems clear seeing it all at once. Oh, you're not wrong, friend. But it does help to identify the better options during my weight loss journey. Cause I have almost all of these right now. Damn if these aren't facts. Today, I'm so excited to share three powerful practices that have helped me love and appreciate my body. First up, daily affirmations, my absolute favorite. I repeat 11 powerful affirmations out loud three times each and it works wonders. Next, maintaining a gratitude journal has been incredible. Each day, I jot down three things that I absolutely appreciate about my body boosting self-love and acceptance significantly. And lastly, cleansing my social media of unrealistic body ideals and following creators that are body positive. This practice has brought immense value to my self-love and confidence journey. Remember, you're not alone on this journey of self-love. If you want to explore all 15 of my life-changing tips, click the link in my bio to check out my free guide. Don't miss out and always remember, you've got this. Maybe self-love is more about taking care of your body and mind will follow. I feel like if you have to go through all of this to be happy with your body, you're not actually happy. Take care of your body. That's how you appreciate your body. Create an echo chamber of shared thoughts and values. Take zero responsibility for one's own health. Call out society and demand free things. And I'm only explaining this once, so please listen closely. When I said that an XXL is not plus size, I did not mean that bodies that fit that size are not a part of the plus size community. What I'm talking about is the difference between an XXL and a 2X. They are cut from two different models. An XXL is still a straight size. It does not account for curvier hips and the shapes that come in a larger body, but a 2X does. That is the point I'm making. From the bare bones of the frames those two sizes are crafted, an XXL is not made to be plus size. It is still made from a straight sized model. Thank you. Should be the same, extra extra large. Thank you. I bought something on Poshmark. It said size 2X, but no pick of a label. When I got it was XXL. I complained and they didn't understand. What? How did I not know this? So much knowledge. Thank you.
Stitch this. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? I'll go first. I came up with a quote that I would tell my younger self if possible. And it's this, embrace your body as a magnificent masterpiece for it's the vessel that carries your spirit through life's journey. Treat it with love, nourishment, and kindness for every curve, scar, and imperfection makes you uniquely beautiful. Release the burdens of others' opinions and let your self-worth shine from within. Remember, true beauty lies in embracing and celebrating the uniqueness that resides in you. Now, stitch this and tell me what piece of advice you would give your younger self if you could. Maybe, don't eat that much as it gets harder. You know, many of us have experienced that moment where we notice the numbers on the scale creeping up. It often starts innocently, but it can quickly snowball. Never shrink yourself so you can have your second heart attack at 40. She is literally killing her own body and going against her own quote. Don't do the 10k calorie challenge every day. I think you should emphasize the nourishment. I'm a fat person, and I love my body, and I live my life to the fullest. So in a way, I think that the comments are right when they say that I promote obesity. Because, or that I glorify obesity. Because I am here to glorify my life. Because it's the only life that I have. And quite frankly, we should all be glorifying our lives. Because do you not deserve to live a glorious life like i think we all do we all deserve to have our needs met we all deserve to have fun we all deserve to live life as we want to and for me the body i have is a fat one and so that is the body in which i do these things Promoting body positivity should not negate the importance of acknowledging the potential health risks associated with obesity. Ignoring the health implications of obesity can be harmful, as it might discourage individuals from seeking necessary medical advice and support. So, if that means that I'm glorifying obesity, so be it. Because, really, that's in the eye of the beholder. Because a lot of people view my content, and they say things they say fat spo oh they say i'm not gonna eat tonight so for them really i have promoted restriction i have promoted not eating because my content has told them that that's what they need to do and i have feelings about that but it really just goes to show you that like I am not promoting anything. I am sharing my life. I am creating content. And what you take from that is what you are going to take from that. While your intention is to share your personal journey, it's important to consider the broader impact of the message. Viewers might interpret your perspective as a general endorsement of obesity, potentially overlooking the diversity of individual health needs. Body positivity should focus on embracing diverse body types without dismissing the significance of maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And if you take from that, that I, as a fat person, live a glorious life and that's the life that you also want to live, like, truly that has nothing to do with my body. But if that's the message that you get, that's the message that you get. It's all about your mindset. I'm just here living life. And if you think it's a glorious one, then cool. Content creators, especially those with a significant following, bear a responsibility for the messages they convey. It's crucial to strike a balance between promoting self-acceptance and providing accurate information about the potential health consequences associated with obesity. Empowering viewers includes encouraging them to make informed choices about their health while embracing self-love. This is like maybe a controversial take, but I don't think that the majority of fat people, until you learn about body liberation and body positivity, no one would choose to continue to be fat in a world where they absolutely hate fat people. People think that I'm glorifying obesity by spreading this, mm. the word and like telling everybody about this information. I, trust me, I wouldn't recommend anybody be fat in this world. It is horrible. Mm. It is so traumatizing. It is so isolating. People are 
evil. They are cruel. Strangers think it's okay to tell you on the bus, Mm -hmm. you're fat. You should lose weight. You're disgusting. Like, it's nonstop. And that leads to people isolating themselves and, like, seeking comfort through Mm -hmm. food. Let's look at the science behind fat cells and why it's essential to understand their persistence in our bodies, even after weight loss. Our bodies store energy in fat cells. When we gain weight, these cells expand, and when we lose weight, they shrink. Interestingly, fat cells don't vanish immediately, they're gradually dissolved over time. Understanding this process helps us appreciate that our bodies are dynamic and adaptable. Knowledge is power. By understanding that fat cells dissolve over time, we empower ourselves to make lifestyle choices that support this natural process. Every nutritious meal and every exercise session contributes to our overall health and gradually reduces the presence of excess fat in our bodies. I'm not fat phobic. I just don't want to be fat. That's not how it works. No, seriously, I have no problem with fat people. I think they're beautiful, I'm all for body positivity or whatever. I just don't want to be fat. Actively not wanting to be fat is fat phobia. And therefore, you're fat phobic. So it's fat phobic to not want to be fat? Yeah, actively not wanting to be fat is fat phobic. Being fat is a choice. Size isn't generally a choice. Promoting the idea that any form of weight loss is inherently fat phobic might negate individual autonomy. People have diverse reasons for their choices, including health, well-being, or personal comfort. Why does me picking lettuce from my garden in my backyard, like fresh lettuce that I was going to eat, why does that make you angry? Why is that? Because you don't do it often enough? Comments like theirs is why society is falling apart. Like, the critical thought is gone. Stay tuned as we uncover the hidden dangers of visceral fat and why it's so crucial to understand and combat it. People that jump into a fat person's comments and say things like, there's no way that you're happy and fat, you're delusional. It's weird because the angriest comments I ever get are from people when they find out that I'm happily married with kids and also fat. They hate it. Why the need to convince people of your happiness? Skinny people are hungry and mean. Let's grasp what visceral fat is. Unlike the subcutaneous fat that sits just beneath your skin, visceral fat resides deep in your abdomen, wrapping around your internal organs like your liver and pancreas. It's not just about how you look, it's about where this fat is located and its impact on your health. No, see, you're totally right. Me being fat doesn't mean I can model, doesn't make me a model. What makes me a model is the fact that I make the majority of my income modeling. Because people hire me to model. Why don't you address the part of the comment that your entire personality is the fact that you are fat? As a plus size model, you are a huge inspiration to me. A huge one in it. The scary part is that visceral fat isn't just an innocent bystander. It's metabolically active, releasing hormones and chemicals that wreak havoc on your body. This fat is linked to a range of serious health issues, even certain cancers. So the other day, my man's giving me a little rub down. I'm loving that shit, right? Until he's rubbing on my leg, grazes across my knee and goes, Baby cakes, what's wrong with your knee? shit i'm looking at my knee what's wrong with it he said i don't know i i I can't feel your plate first of all you mean kneecap second of all you just forgot i'm a fat fuck it's there it's just under it's under the layers of protective material sir are you new here so why is visceral fat so bad well It surrounds vital organs, interfering with their normal functions. It disrupts insulin production, leading to insulin resistance and diabetes. It also increases inflammation in the body, a key factor in many chronic diseases. Plus, it messes with your cholesterol levels, raising the risk of heart problems.
bet that isn't 20 minutes but only the three squats. How much is she paying you to glaze her with delusions? Keep up work and you'll get there. Get where? Don't think she's working out to lose weight but more just stay healthy. Tell me you need a personal trainer without telling me you need a personal trainer. But here's the good news. You can fight back visceral fat. Through a combination of a balanced diet, regular exercise, and stress management, you can reduce visceral fat significantly. Incorporating cardio and strength training exercises, adopting a whole foods-based diet, and getting enough sleep are all essential strategies. Nobody, including myself, has told a thin person, a skinny person, an athletic person, a mid-sized person that they can't participate in body positivity. You can lie to your mom, but you can't lie to me. That's never happened. What is typically happening is someone is educating that individual to say, you know what, body positivity wouldn't exist as we know it today if it weren't for fat liberationists, if it weren't for the work of queer, fat, disabled, black activists long before us addressing size-based discrimination. Systemic level issues like medical and insurance-based size discrimination. Well, as business, insurers assess the risk of insuring a particular person. Which is the whole point. They don't want to lose money, of course. How is that discrimination? Job opportunity discrimination. But how can you tell an employer who to hire? Even statistics say that obese people use more sick days and have lower productivity. Systemic level issues like medical and insurance-based size discrimination, job opportunity discrimination, the fact that it is still okay to openly mock and harass fat people for purely just existing. So let me ask you this. Have those issues been addressed? Have they been fixed? Have they been rectified? Have we moved past that issue as a society? What issues? You said insurance. Which is complete nonsense. Job opportunities. Maybe there should be fat soccer players. Mocking. Which goes both ways. And medical discrimination which is questionable. Absolutely not. They haven't. And at the same time, you've seen body positivity bring all of this other messaging around love yourself no matter what, embrace all of your insecurities, all bodies are good bodies, blah, blah, blah. And while that messaging is great and it is important for everybody to embrace, we have added a goal without ever having achieved the initial ones from the social movement that is responsible for this work to begin with. And when you add new goals and add new messaging without ever having achieved the initial ones within a social movement, it's no longer coexisting. You've now co-opted a movement. And you can see this playing out in real time within the movement because you have visibly fat people saying, I accept and love myself no matter what. And those people get openly mocked and harassed. One of the unintended consequences of the body positivity movement is the pressure it can create to be unconditionally positive about one's body. You're promoting obesity, you're promoting an unhealthy lifestyle. But that never happens when it's a thin or mid-sized girl giving the same exact messaging. That's all like, yes, queen, girl, slay. So if you are thin or athletic or straight-sized or mid-sized queen, it's not that you're not welcome within body positivity. I feel very much the opposite. I feel like I want you there because other people who have a similar body size to yours, which is deemed socially acceptable and desirable to have, are more likely to listen to you talking about these things than they are to me or certainly anybody larger than me. But if you are coming into this movement purely to make yourself feel better about your own insecurities or to put a word to that sense of worthlessness that unrealistic and gross beauty standards have given to every single one of us. But it's not about beauty. Regardless of our body size, then honestly, no, I don't want you a part of it. That individualist mindset tells me that you have no interest in understanding the initial goals or roots of the movement, nor will you ever take a stand for more marginalized identities and body sizes than yours. I left a comment and you literally told me I can't participate in your content because I am intentionally losing weight so. Fat acceptance can inadvertently reinforce certain beauty standards. By highlighting specific body types as the epitome of body positivity there's a risk of excluding individuals who don't fit these ideals. Hey fatties, let's take the stairs together. Welcome back to my series where I, a very fat person, take the stairs, even if it takes me time, even if it means that I'm going to be out of breath. Because here's the thing, the fat phobes hate me no matter what. 
I take the escalator, they hate me. I take the elevator, they hate me. I take the stairs, they hate me. I'm out of breath, they hate me. I'm taking my time, they hate me. And I am terrified to just exist in my body and I'm sick of it. I actually am able lately to take the stairs and I want to take the stairs. But it means I'm out of breath. It means like right here I have to take a break. And that means that I'm usually in fear. I'm scared of people judging me and they do, trust me. Today I was feeling able and so I did it and I took my time and I was out of breath and guess what? I was breathing loudly and I was walking slowly but damn does it ever feel good when I make it to the top. There weren't a lot of people around tonight so it was my perfect opportunity. I'm here to normalize some fatties taking the stairs. Breathe heavy, breathe good and make it to the top. Everyone would praise this. Keep it up. The Hunger Games music is taking me out. This is my Rocky training montage. While everyone deserves respect and acceptance, it's essential to encourage balanced discussions about health. Ignoring the potential health risks associated with extreme weight can hinder important conversations about overall well-being. Here are some tips from a doctor on how to eat healthy. Number one, calculate how much time you have to prepare your food. Number two, calculate how much money you have to buy your food. Number three, calculate whether you have enough money to pay for fuel to cook your food. Number four, assess your food prep area. Do you have a kitchen, appliances, that sort of thing? Number five, ask yourself whether you have the physical or mental energy to prepare your food. Number six, go from there. Because I can assure you, as a doctor, that a stressed out, exhausted person eating a quote unquote healthy, balanced, nutritious meal is not actually healthy. You can't be healthy if you're stressed. That's it. That's my advice. What advice? My God, after watching your vids, I wish you were my doctor. Healthy eating is indeed influenced by various elements but it's equally vital to delve deeper into the nutritional aspects and the psychological relationship people have with food. Four words that I hate are one size fits most. Who the fuck is most? Because it's not me. It's never been me. And this isn't a fat thing. Believe me, I could go off on how capitalism completely fails fat people in providing them with clothes that actually fit. This is about hat sizes, okay? This isn't fat. This part of my head, this part is fat. This part is skull. And in high school, when I was playing football, they had to order me a larger helmet to fit my large ass, big ass skull of a head. And therefore, I never get a hat that fits properly. And I'm just tired of particularly how they frame it as one size fits most. Fuck you most. One size fits skinny ass heads. This has to be a joke. You are angry about hat. Why are we discussing this? Aren't there bigger problems? Do you want a petition? One size fits most. That's what I heard at the end there. The downside of a big ass brain. 